You know, one of the things that's most fascinating about this conference, this particular presentation, yesterday one of the juvenile judges in Louisiana, we met together, and she found out that I was coming to, to Congress to speak before the, this particular caucus. And she, she asked me a question. You know, her, her husband is the state president of Louisiana NAACP, you know, so they're definitely active in a lot of things in the community. And she said, is this going to be the real deal, or is this going to be political fluff? She said a lot of times there's political fluff that gets wrapped up in the midst of the real deal. So I'm glad that I'll be able to go back and tell her that this is the real deal. You know, because the people who are involved, not just the people on this panel, not just the people who are out here, but there are a lot of other people who have the same interests at heart that we all do. Penal reform, juvenile justice, you know, these are two areas. It starts with the juvenile. It started in all of our lives as juveniles. You know, whatever led us to crime, and I'm originally from Chicago. I came up in the gangs in Chicago. I left Chicago on the run. And then when the organization I was involved in became a large criminal organization. Went through Shreveport, Louisiana, committed an armed robbery. It learned, led to a shootout with police. Two police officers were shot. My co-defendant was shot once in the stomach with a shotgun. I was shot twice, once through both legs and once in the head. There's a 357 Magnum bullet in my head right now. I have a plate over the roof of my mouth, and if I take it out, it'll show. I use it to, when I'm speaking to young people, especially the, the so-called hardcore, because when they look into a person's mouth and they see this large gapping hole that show the path that a 357 Magnum carry, it kind of makes them flinch. They listen a little bit more. They let, it lets them realize that they might not be invincible after all. And it gives me the opportunity to speak to them. You know, it's by the grace of God that I'm standing. It's by the grace of God that I survived 27 and a half years in the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. And one thing that I begin to find out is I begin to come to myself and understand that it was my decisions that placed me there. It wasn't the system. You know, you know, I can blame it on the system. I can blame it on a, a whole bunch of things. I can blame it on my mother and father being, being divorced. But my brother never went to prison. We came up in the same household. You know, so I had to look at my decisions, the decisions that I made. And once I found myself trapped, I said, okay, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to stay here for the rest of my life and die here? Or am I suddenly going to become, grow where I have been replanted? Which is one of the mad, it was one of the most violent prisons in the nation at that time. And I decided to make a change by the grace of God. Christianity became my foundation. I became involved in every education program that I could become involved in. Starting out first as a student, went back later as an instructor, became a le leader and president of a lot of programs, and it just continued on and on and on. And I'm sure just like everybody here, we can just talk about, like I say, for hours about the things we've done. But what it did, it helped to shape me, to shape my life, and I understood the pattern that I took. First it was morals, then it was education, then it was the strength and the stability not to allow anything to sway me off my path. It did not matter that the court had sentenced me to serve 75 years without the benefit of parole, probation, or suspension of sentence. I was not seeing that. I was seeing freedom. I was seeing freedom first while I was in there, and then I was going to someday walk out the gates of that prison and teach other people how to do the same thing along the way. And it started in there, and it continues out here. Juveniles have a real, real soft spot in my heart because I see them running madly and just being trapped in the system. You know, one of the things that's really crushed so many young people is the private prison industrial complex, you know, because it's all about a dollar. You know, they might have a few good ones, but overall it's all about a dollar and they get caught up. You know, there's, you know, you know I was looking at this recent documentary about people getting caught up. At one time in Louisiana, there was one particular parish down there to where, you know, they would charge parents for not controlling their children. And most parishes, you know, down in Louisiana they call parishes, other places they call county. Most parishes didn't enforce it, but this particular parish was enforcing. You don't control your child, you're going to get fined. Parents started getting fined. You don't control your child, you're going to jail. Then all of a sudden this child would be, this juvenile would be arrested, given a slap on the wrist, but would have been by the district attorney charged as an adult. So you got a 
an adult slap on the wrist. Two slap, adult slap on the wrist. There, as juveniles, multiple offenders eligible for a life sentence. You know, three times, three strikes you're out in any state. You know, a habitual offender. You know, so there's all sorts of games that have been played. And like I said, I'm going to be glad to be able to return. And when I sit down in front of that judge Saturday, I'm going to tell her that it was not political fluff. Right.